all right here. I got my watercolors. I got some of my favorite art supplies. In case it gets hot, I have a fan. I've got my uh, ear cleaner, my back massager in case I start getting any tight muscles from drawing so much. I got not enough chocolate, but some. And I've got some snacks and things to nature journal in case I get hungry. Lots of cool stuff to look at. Different plants. We're going to do some cool color matching activities. Looking at some different flowers and inflorescences. There are skulls, more skulls, partial skulls, claws. Bet you can't guess what that is. And all kinds of cool things that we can nature journal together today. So without further ado, let's get into it. I Part of the reason why I have all this cool stuff on my table is because I just did an interview with this nature journaling kid. His name is Ray Bonto. Some of you may know him already. Where can this go? Some of you may know Ray Bonto already. Guess that's not going to hold that antler. Some of you may know Ray Bonto already. He's only 10 years old and he's nature journaling like crazy. And I got to interview him. He lives in London. So it's actually like 10 o'clock there right now. Um, so a little bit late, but he, he used to take nature journaling classes in the middle of the night. Some of you may know him from some of the nature journal clubs that are online. I just got done interviewing him. It wasn't a live interview, so I'm going to edit it and then it's going to come out for all of you later. But I still have all of this cool stuff because we did some nature journaling together. So I have a lot of the cool stuff still on my desk and I thought, you know, why not um, incorporate a bunch of this into the live episode? Do you know what this is? This is probably something that you actually have in your house right now. And if you think there's nothing to nature journal in your home and it's just Marley's house that has all this crazy stuff for nature journaling, well, that's not true because I bet you have one of these in your house right now. And there's so many ways that you can nature journal this. Um, and I have some more stuff that I wanted to look at and potentially nature journal that I've been using for some of my classes lately. And there's even a surprise, surprise guest. And if you can tell what this is, then you probably can guess who the surprise guest is. So I'm going to switch. I see Jackson's on here. Hey, Jackson. Um, I'm going to show you with the document camera real quick what this nature clue is. Um, and if you can decipher that, you might have an idea who is our special guest today that we may be able to nature journal. And we'll look at that a little bit more later. But first, I thought it would be really cool to even do some watercolor color matching. And um, to start off with that, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take my document camera and put it down really close. Um, and put different things under it. And so get your watercolor ready at home. If you don't have watercolor at home, you could just watch me do the color matching, but it won't be as fun. So hopefully you'll have watercolor by next week. And obviously I use um, and recommend John Muir Law's palette is amazing. Um, if you want to just dive right into some professional grade uh, materials. But otherwise, I would say like the Cotman Windsor, the Windsor Newton um, Cotman um, watercolor palette is probably a good place to start. But it's starting to um, practice with watercolor is something that I highly recommend. Now I have all this stuff in the way. Um, something that I highly recommend, and I'm going to do some right now. Here, here are some color matching um, things that I did with Ray Bonto. And um, what I'm going to do, obviously cameras are not perfect in this department. So we'll just do our best. If we were in person together, that would be even better in terms of seeing color true to the color um, and capturing that in our watercolor. Cameras aren't always the greatest for that, but um, we will do our best. And I will put one at a time, different things under the camera, and then I'll set a timer for a minute and a half um, is all we will have on each Thing that we will um, try to match the color on. So without further ado, actually, how about let's let's be crazy and make it one minute and 23 seconds. Um, that seemed like that was plenty of time when Ray Bonto and I were doing it. 
So let's see if we can um, we can match that. So get your watercolor palette ready, whatever kind you use. Make sure you have some mixing spaces that are all ready to go. If you have a lot of color already in your mixing spaces, you might want to clean it out just a little bit more like this one so that you have a space to do it. Um, it's okay. Like usually when I go nature journaling, I do have quite a messy um, mixing area and I often am able to use those colors. And artists will argue about this until the end of time um, and pretend like there's actually like a real reason why you should do always have it clean or always leave it dirty. But I don't think it's necessary to be that dogmatic about it. But for today's exercise, having a little bit of empty space is probably going to be useful. Um, get your water or water brushes and other brushes ready. And then also get a, um, one thing I've been doing lately is just taking a little bit of tape like this and getting um, a paper towel folded up a couple times. And then I tape that right onto my desk and I can even flip it over and reuse it a couple times. That's a little studio trick. You could probably even just like tape this right onto your shirt and then just do that. Um, as long as you don't put it on your body and it will rip out hairs and be painful. Um, so get that all ready to go. And then what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna change the camera here. I still have pieces of that leaf in my mouth from snacking on it. And um, what we're gonna do is we're gonna change the camera here. I'll put the camera really close to the thing that we're gonna color match. I'll set the timer and then we'll go. So the first thing that we're gonna do and I'll try to tell you what the things are afterwards because I actually think it's more fun if you don't know if you don't know what the object is until um, after you try to match the color. Ooh, leaves are flying out of my mouth. Um, so I'm getting this document camera all set up here, and we'll start with the first object. So get your watercolor ready. Oops, it's pointed at the ceiling. All right, let me get a good uh, view of this color here. So there's gonna be some variation in color, especially like on this one right here. But what I, but, um, Oh no, my camera just, one of my cameras just fell on the ground. Um, what I recommend that you do is just choose one area, choose a color in one area, like, whoa, let me get this just right here. Thanks for bearing with me. That edge is where it's, it's really good. So what I would recommend is choosing, and what I'm going to do for mine is I'm going to take... Um, I wish I could reduce this on the screen more easily, but like I'm going to take, see way down here, I'm going to take just this color in this bottom left hand corner and try to match that. Another one you could do, it would be like this zone in here. Um, let me see if I can get that. It's a little bit better. Whoa, no, that was not. It's so interesting how the camera just totally changed the color. Um, okay, it changed the focus too. So let's just try to match this color up in here um and i'm gonna set the timer the timer is for one minute and 23 seconds so get your watercolor ready and go i'm using the john muir laws palette and i think there's a couple colors in here that should be really helpful in mixing this even though none of them by themselves would match this color i don't think all right, so I mix about three different things together and that's looking pretty on point. You can do multiple swatches if you want. That's how I often do it, sort of like a shotgun approach. And if you were doing this in the field, like you were really diligent about matching the color of something, you'd probably take little notes, abbreviated letters for your pigments and do multiple swatches um, and try them with more or less water to get um, variation in value. Um, and then take the notes next to it. And then um, by doing that, you get a closer approximation of the color of whatever subject you're trying to, to match. And it's a, it can be a really fun thing to do in and of itself, but it's a, an essential skill for um, 
making better watercolor paintings and nature journal pages is color matching. And you could really spend your whole life basically um, working on color matching. So I've got quite a few swatches here, even of different sizes. And our time is up. Okay, so let's see what um, what I got here. I'll show you my personal um, swatches. And the main colors that I used um, were, I used my um, quinacridone sienna, which is a really cool color. Um, and I'll hold the object up here. It was weird at first, the camera, the document camera was picking up the um, the warmer colors in this. And I feel like a lot of natural light in my house today is making it hard um, for the cameras to adapt. But um, first there was a lot, you could really see on this mushroom, these rich reds. Um, it's not showing up super great right now. But um, the rich reds really showed up, and then I tried to adjust the camera, and it changed a little bit. But you can see here some of the different swatches I did trying to match the color. And I, I relied a lot on my um, quinacridone sienna, which definitely, when, when the light hits this right and you can see the really warm, rich red colors, um, quinacridone sienna, um, I would say, matches that quite well. Um, quinacridone sienna is up here if you have the John Muir Laws palette. And then the other one I was using a lot was the, I think it's the Italian burnt sienna or the burnt umber, um, a nice rich brown with some red in it. And I mixed those two together. And I think those two colors were the only colors that I used. I might've used a little bit of quinacridone gold, which is a very, um, very adaptable color. Quinacridone gold can help with a lot of things. All right. So now um, we're going to do the next color matching. So clean off your clean off your brush and get your brush all clean um, and we're gonna do another one but this is a really beautiful fungus um, there this genus is diverse there is some species in this genus that grow where I live this particular one is usually cultivated and used as um, medicine it's reishi Ganoderma I forget the species name the local one is Ganoderma oplanatum I can't remember this is Ganoderma um, something else and uh, has some really beautiful um, earth tones in it good practice getting those and also this is a good um, a good object to remind you that purples and browns are actually really closely related colors even though people in our culture at least in their minds don't think of them um, very similarly look at that there's purple and brown right next to each other on my shirt but yeah if you study color theory and do some color mixing, you'll realize purples and browns are actually um, closely related um, colors. So this is a good example of that. And just having a little bit of that color theory um, background, when you're in the field nature journaling and you see something like this, you can um, think about using some purples from your palette to match this. And actually, um, the kid I just interviewed, Ray Bonto, I think when we did a color matching activity in the interview he um he used purple on this one okay speaking of purple actually i'm not going to do another purple object because that would make it easy for you so get ready get your brushes cleaned i'm going to set up the next uh the next color that we're going to try to match here um and put the document camera really close up on it so you get a nice view and can't really see the identity of the object so much as the color so, oh, and I see that Nature Sketches and that is on here. Good to see you. Um, hopefully you have your watercolor ready to go. All right, so I know it's a little bit gray, but um, let's see, actually maybe I can, no. I think it's, it's, it's pale, but I think that's probably fine. Maybe turn down the light a little bit. Okay, there we go. So I'm going to set the timer right now for a minute and 23 seconds. Get your watercolor ready and go. Obviously on this one, if you zoomed in really close, you know, this is an interesting thing, actually. If, if you zoom in really close on anything, you'll realize it's like a point to list painting. There's, there's, there's a bunch of different colors mixed together. It's like the, the television screen or your computer screen. If you zoomed in close enough, you would see there's discrete colors. Discrete meaning they're not blended together. They're individual identities. Um, and that those discrete colors 
and tiny dots close to each other all mixed together in your in your eye it's called optical blending and makes another color so there's basically just like color blending that you do with your watercolor paint that's happening um in your in your perception when you see something that is made up of teeny discrete dots of color so like if we zoomed in on this leaf um you could even see it right now that um with without zooming in without a microscope or anything that there's different spots together and then when you see that that leaf from far away all of that really blends in your mind um and in your eye to make that color so everything is a pointillist painting um, basically until you get down to like i don't know a cellular or molecular level maybe and watercolor oh time is up sometimes with watercolor you can create that effect um with texture or mixing things like doing a wet on wet and you can get that effect that there's multiple colors mixed into one so i don't know what colors you used for that one or if that one was easier or not but one thing people mess up on all the time is greens and if you have the same watercolor palette as i do be really careful of hooker's green or any of those really saturated greens because in your mind you think that plants are green and um symbolically and in cartoons that is true but to tell you the truth most things are a little bit off green and or gray or have a lot more yellow or even blue or even purple in them so being aware and actually looking at your subject before you reach for the color is really important that's important with all the colors even though green is a major one but like look at this so you see this and i take it away and if you ask if you were asked what color it is you'd probably just say red but when you're actually drawing something or painting something or nature journaling you have the opportunity to look more carefully and keep checking. Don't trust your first first glance impression of what that color is. Like, what kind of red is it? Be more specific. And they've done these studies on how many colors humans can recognize, and you'd be blown away by how few colors. But when they're side by side, people can recognize more because they're comparing, oh, this green is a little bit different. But if you just show them one color at a time, people have a very small number of colors that they can distinguish. So that comparison and actually really paying attention and not believing your first look is important. So I'll show you the color that I mixed for that one. Maybe I'll actually use my um, document camera to show you the color that I mixed. And um, then I'll show you which colors in my palette I used. And then we'll do the next challenge. All right, so you can see right here, um, this is where I mixed my green. And up here, I'm using mostly chromium oxide, um, which is um, that pale one in the small spot there on the John Muir Laws palette. That's the chromium oxide um, right there. And I mixed it into my uh, mixing area. So there might have been a little bit of other colors. Um, and this is what I got, is this top row. Um, and then this bottom row is a slightly different mix. I took the same thing I was using, the chromium oxide, with a little bit more in here. And you can see that I came down here to where my gouache is. Um, and this is white gouache, believe it or not, hiding underneath there. I mixed it with um, some of my other colors. So that's one thing to be aware of if you're using watercolor is that um, white is usually provided by our paper. So the more paper that you let come through, the, the, the brighter, the more white you have, instead of like with acrylic or oil, you'd be adding white from a tube. However, that being said, you can't always use the paper and the paper only does so much. Um, the other thing you can do is add gouache. So this bottom row here, that's exactly what I did. I added gouache um, and, uh, my light got so dim, sorry about that. Um, down there I added gouache, and that's another way you can modify color. So for example, pink. A lot of people think that pink is just a color by itself, a pigment, but a lot of the pink pigments, especially like this um, quinacridone pink, is really strong, and if you paint that directly, it's quite dark, um, and it's not what people think of as pink. Most people think of it pink as something like this, um, that's a much lighter value. So that just shows how value 
and hue are conflated in our minds and in our language, especially if you haven't taken any like art classes. And so um, to get that sort of pink that most people think of as pink, you usually have to add white. And that can be done with your paper, making a really, really watered down wash from the quinacridone um, pink, or you can add gouache. And that's what I usually do down here. And pink and, pink and this sort of um, mint green color are some of the main colors I mix down here in my gouache area. So I have this area designated for mixing gouache because you don't really want gouache um, mixed into your other pigments. Um, it can be a problem because it takes away from the transparency because um, by definition, gouache is opaque. However, like I said, there are certain colors that might be in your environment or that you might use often that um, will benefit from the addition of gouache. And um, now that I gave away that really big hint, we're gonna do a color um, that I find extremely challenging and is really common in my area. It might not show up that great on the camera, but um, right now before all of the trees leaf out, a lot of the deciduous trees are covered in this lichen. And um, this lichen in my mind is more green than it really is in reality. And like right now it even looks kind of gray, but you can see there's even like a little bit of blue um, to that. So we are going to zoom in. I shouldn't have told you what it was or given you that trick I just gave you first, but we're gonna zoom in on this on the document camera and see if we can match that color. So really pay attention um, the color includes the value and the value is really important. So if you get the value wrong, it doesn't matter if the hue is on point. And this is one of those subjects where it's really obvious if you get the value wrong. Um, I'm going to see if I can experiment a little bit here before you get started to see if I can, um, you know, have the camera do the best job possible because um, sometimes the camera is really the thing that changes the color. You can see even right now, um, inside of that shadow area, that is kind of the color I'm talking about in there. And you can see that where the light is hitting it more directly, it's actually almost not green at all. Um, so that's something that's interesting to notice and is a factor of the light. Now, let me see if I can change. This is a very blue sort of daylight color light. Let me see if I warm it up a little bit more. That doesn't look right either. Now see how it totally changed color just with the color of the light, but still in the shadow, it's still blue. And in the shadow, it's actually getting hit by natural light from outdoors. So that might be, yeah, look at that. So when it's not getting hit directly, it has a much more, I would say, of that um, green color. So I'm actually going to turn the light away and see how that color changes. All right. So if we're competing, hopefully you didn't start uh, matching the color yet because I'm going to be way behind you. But let me see if I can turn this light away and get that natural color um, and we'll try to match that. So I know that's kind of dark, um, but choose a spot really close in. Maybe, um, you know, like zoom in on a little area right here where my pointer is at. Um, I'm pointing with a porcupine quill, by the way. Um, try to match that color or like that color. The value is quite a bit darker now than it would be usually in the outdoors but let's match this color it's kind of similar to the last one but don't don't just use the exact same color from last time that would be that wouldn't be trying hard enough <laughs> okay oh the timer i need to set the timer 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 okay one minute go so let me look at it really carefully okay i see i'm tempted to just use the exact same color i mixed for the last one i kind of think that's what i should do but maybe i'll add a teeny bit of yellow to it warm it up a little bit more because it does look warmer now you'll see if it's right next to your last color matching you'll know if you're using the exact color or not. And you can always do a couple variations of it. One minute, 23 seconds is quite a bit of time to mix a color, I would say. Um, if you want to be really technical, and I used to do this a lot more, whoops, I did, I should have watered that down. You can write down the pigment letters next to it. So if I'm using chromium oxide, I would just write CO. 
And the more you do that and the more technical you are about that, probably the better. Um, the more you work with your same palette, the better because you'll remember um, the colors much more. And you can even reference, if you really want to learn faster, you probably create like a reference sheet um, where you've done these mixes and um, you can actually refer to that sheet instead of just trying to make it up every time um, that you're matching colors. So I'll show you mine. I think it actually ended up being, I kind of just used almost the exact same. Um, and you can see here one example where I took chromium oxide and look how it stands out like crazy. I took some chromium oxide straight from the palette and put it down there. This is the following swatches right after that one going to the right um, are the exact same color just toned down by adding more water. Um, so that's my lichen color. What I find um, happens is when I'm out in nature and I'm trying to draw these trees that are covered in this lichen, it's really challenging. And I think if I were using acrylic or oil, it would be much, much easier. But what happens is um, like compare the value of this even to my face or to my, to my hair. Look how it, it how much lighter it is compared to my hair. And so what happens is when you're drawing a tree, um, if these, if the branches are completely covered in this, they're really pale. And usually when we draw trees, we use like dark lines for the branches and, um, trying to draw branches with light lines, um, without an outline is very counterintuitive to how drawing with ink or watercolor or pencil or anything like that works. Because look, like these antlers, we're drawing the outline, even though the actual subject is a very pale, might be a very pale um, subject, we are drawing the outlines, even though that line doesn't necessarily exist. So trying to match your colors and paying more attention to color is going to help with that. All right, so get your um, brush cleaned and get ready for the next color. Um, get every all of that, um, that you know those green pigments or whatever off of there and get ready for the next one um i'm going to set it up right now it's going to be a little bit different whoa whoa i almost gave it away okay um i'm going to switch to the um document camera here okay so get ready All right, I know it's blurry, but that's actually kind of good. So I'm gonna set the timer. Um, you have one minute and 23 seconds to try to get this. And remember, you can use the shotgun effect like me and do multiple swatches. If you do and you're mixing in different colors, make sure um, if you wanna be technical, write down what the, what the pigments are you're using. If you're using the John Muir Laws palette like I am, there is a color uh, that by itself is probably, there's a pigment in one of the pans that basically matches this almost exactly. The reason to do sort of that, if you've seen the ones where I do where I have like multiple swatches kind of in a line, one of the reasons to do that is to get a spectrum of how, how watered down the pigment is. It's also just kind of meditative, and I used to do this all the time and add it to my nature journaling pages, and combined with some sketches and some writing, or even just combined with writing, like this is the perfect kind of thing you can do if you think you can't draw. Oh, I should add this to my video, how to nature journal if you can't draw, because doing color swatches and just trying to match colors to your environment is just totally, um, friendly to someone who, who feels like they can't, they're not that good at drawing. Sometimes when I'm really tired, that's all I do in my nature journal. Like when I'm traveling or in an airport even. Okay, put your colors down. Can you guess what this object is that you're trying to match a color of right now? I bet you can't, unless you saw it when I was kind of getting it in position. That's right, it's my massager. This grows on a special plant that grows um, massagers. Uh, you can also make water bottles out of these too.
It kind of looks like something from the Flintstones. Okay, so a lot of times when you see something and you know what it is, it makes it harder to match the color. So a lot of artists will even make a sort of frame, sort of like the viewfinder that I use for landscape vetoes. If you haven't watched it already, watch that video where I say how to make one. Well, I don't have any of the cutout ones, but you can make a piece of paper like this and cut a really cut a really small hole in it and then put it on things and just look at the color and, and, and focus on just one area of color. Like you'd put that on there and just have a little hole on it. You can do it on paintings too, or like if you have art history books, you can just cut a hole like that and then you can put it on and study um, old master paintings that way. Okay, you might've noticed, but during that last one, I had to eat some chocolate. I'm not sponsored by this company, but seriously, if you can get this Alter Eco chocolate's really good. And I just tried the sea salt one. It's definitely taking my nature journaling to the next level. And supposedly, you know, look, you could even nature journal off of this in here. Look at that. It's a multi-story agroforestry system. So cacao, like coffee, is a, a shade plant. And so you can grow timber trees or you can grow other um, either, you know, refuge for birds or biodiversity trees or other um, economically useful trees above. And then look, there's even bananas in here. So that's a really cool um, analog farming kind of thing. Yeah, you could totally nature journal off of that. Maybe someone should um, send me to like a cacao farm, go nature journal there, and then we could like try chocolate afterwards. When COVID is over and you want to sign up for a, um, you want to sign up for a class, where we go nature journaling in tropical rainforests and then try uh, different types of fancy chocolate. Let me know in the comments if that's a class that you would sign up for. Oh, I love this. Um, Alexandra has a really cool idea um, that's very advanced. And I think that would be super fun. It sounds like, let me know how, what kind of color isolating you're doing. Like if that's, you know, more of a fine art thing or for nature journaling, but it's a really cool concept. Just going back to that idea of limiting how much you see because we bring in so much information that's great for survival um, in an information rich environment, but it's not so great for the artist because the artist really needs to limit what they see instead. Really cool idea, Alexandra. Okay, let's get ready for the next one. Um, let me look around here, what I have, what options I have. Get ready for the next color matching. I hope I can fit this. Um, I hope I can fit this underneath the um, camera. And this is going to be a good example. Um, this is going to be a good example of that optical blending. That, if you're an art student or want to know more about art, it's a really cool term to know about. Optical blending is when your eye actually blends the colors together. So that's why pointillism can work. So this is sort of an example of that because if we zoomed in on this subject, the more we zoom, zoom in on it, the more we'd realize the colors are separate, that they're not blending together. But for our drawing, we might want to um, blend them together. Let's see here. Oh, it's rolling on the table. Okay, so get your color palette, or if you're using colored pencils too, um, I wasn't even thinking about teaching this for people who have colored pencils. Um, okay, here we go, here we go. Sorry, this is hard to get things zoomed in like this close, um, but I'm using my document camera here. There's probably a better way I could be doing this if I had like some different setup, but let's work with what we got here. Okay, so there's there's a variety of, of colors kind of mixed in here, but what I would recommend doing if I could, oh, if I had one of those cards right now with the hole in it, I could do this. I could slide that in. That would be really cool. Okay. Unfortunately, I can't do that. So instead of using that, I'll just use this pointer. But what I would do is try to choose an area or you can do multiple swatches at the same time, but try to choose a discrete area like over here like right in this area and try to match that color. Or, you know, if you want to come out here and match it. 
So I'm going to set the timer, 1 minute 23 seconds. Get your brushes ready. Get your watercolor ready. If you're doing colored pencils, um, that sounds great too, and I can't provide as much uh, <laughs> feedback or input because I hardly ever use colored pencils. Um, okay, 1 minute 23 seconds. Go! Try to match this color, and this could be a place where watercolor could really shine, um, especially if you're taking more time to use glazing techniques, where you're putting down a layer, letting it dry, then putting down another layer of color. Whoa, a really powerful um, watercolor technique that I hardly ever do. It is possible to do it in the field um, while you're nature journaling in the field, and maybe even while you're nature journaling in extreme situations but it's probably more conducive to doing in the studio because you do need that time. If you have a, um, if you have one of these, um, then it's really easy to do in the studio because you can speed up the drawing process and uh, speed up the drawing process a little bit and get those glazes down. However, a minute and 23 seconds is probably still not enough time. So what I've actually done is kind of taking a slightly different technique or um, another possibility would be to do sort of like a wet on wet. Some colors, some watercolor pigments will stay discreet, like they won't mix with each other immediately or there could be a little bit of granulation um, in one of the colors and that can create some nice effects. They're just unpredictable. Um, oh my goodness, that went by really fast. Let me just finish these two swatches here. Um, and um, show you what I got. So there's a couple colors that are the major colors in this one. Um, obviously there's pinks and yellows. Um, and uh, I tried to, I was talking so much about doing um, glazing that, um, and then I had to you know, bring out my, also it's good if, you, if you're a watercolorist, then um, you have a good excuse for, for having a um, hair dryer because you know, I know some people who feel like they have to have an excuse for having a, a blow dryer in their house. But um, if you do watercolor like me, then you can just say like, oh, well, that's for that's because I'm an artist, you know. Um, anyways, uh, you can see here, these are the, the color swatches I did um, for this cool tuber. I love the colors on these things. And I would say, like, holding it up, that I've got somewhat of the spectrum. This top one, I could go back and practice glazing on. And what I really should do is write notes on all of that. So um, what I'm going to do right now is, and you can do this too, um, is go through and add some notes to mine. Because um, if you want to be a real diligent student, that's the thing that you would do. And it will just help you learn faster. And so now I'm going to go on a rant about self-awareness. If you've been watching my channel for a while um, or taking any classes with me, you know that I think self-awareness is one of the most important um, things to, to, to know about <laughs> or to learn um, or to teach. And so they, it applies, self-awareness applies to everything. And uh, luckily, Nature Journaling has all of these cool self-awareness tools built right into it. And self-awareness can help you learn faster. Whether you're learning art or whether you're learning natural history, the self-awareness can help. So the rant about self-awareness is just that um, there's, a, there's a spectrum, right? So there's a spectrum when you're making art or nature journaling of how like um, technical and detail oriented um, and like analytical you want to be versus how free. And, and free has a really nice connotation and maybe there's other words like OCD or like uptight um, that have a negative connotation or maybe some people have there's words that have a positive connotation for that end of the spectrum. But I could just spend all day kind of making swatches like this and playing around with watercolor and that would be totally fine. And I could go out in the field and whenever I nature journal in the field, I could just use my color like create like however I want and I could never look at the back at the names of what the colors are. I could, you know, never research what the different um, colors are made out of or which one's more light fast or look them up on the company website. I could, you know, never do a color mixing chart where I mix like every single color combination of colors in my watercolor palette 
like I could avoid doing all of those things um, and that's fine. Um, and I will still learn doing watercolor and art that way. But I think it's really important to think about like what your goals are and um, you know, what comes naturally and what might be pushing yourself a little bit more. So, you know, right now I'm going to go back and I am going to add um, notes about what these colors were that I mixed. And I am going to be more on that end of the spectrum of being very like careful and like analytical and um, detail oriented. And if you, if you feel like that's what you naturally do, maybe every once in a while step back and, and ask yourself, would being more free right now or like less um, analytical help my art or my nature journaling? And if you're the opposite, if you never do anything like this, you never do um, research about like your colors or try to memorize your colors or anything like that, if you're if you consider yourself like more free in your art and your nature journaling ask yourself why why do you do that like what part of you benefits from that how is that connected to your values and your goals in art and nature journaling and when would it be in service to your goals and your values in art and nature journaling to to push yourself a little bit more in the other way and be more technical do a color mixing chart look up your colors, try to try to memorize the names of them, you know, make little flashcards or whatever. So just to be aware of that instead of just assuming, oh, I'm just more this way of an artist or I'm more this way or I don't do that because that's not my style. Don't don't let yourself just do that automatically without thinking about it. So that's my rant about self-awareness. And to tell you the truth, I think those kind of little tidbits are actually the most difficult thing for me to teach you. Um, and the hardest thing for us to learn as artists and nature journalers. So if my goal is to um, have the biggest impact on um, your ability to see more in nature and to learn faster, then I absolutely need to address these um, self-awareness pieces because they have the biggest impact from my experience. And they're the hardest that you don't learn them automatically. So luckily I remember what a lot of these are. I'm just going to go back um, and write them down. And I'm going to write down the things, the colors I was trying to match. This was a really cool um, oak leaf that we didn't do right now, um, but I did with Ray Bonto. So this is an oak leaf, but like really fresh oak leaf um, from a, I think it's a, some type of black oak. And then the colors I used mainly were um, QP, quinacridone pink. Um, I used to be way more technical about doing all of this stuff um, and I've been a little bit less so like I said just paying attention like maybe it's time for me to be a little bit more technical again because um, I've forgotten some of my colors lately so QP is quinacridone pink plus um, I think I just used the Hansa yellow medium HYM if you actually can come up with, you know, abbreviations for all of your um, colors and really remember them well, it will make a difference in your painting for sure. They'll become your friends. They're like familiar friends. And your color mixing will be faster and more accurate in the field. Um, I used a uh, Windsor Violet in some of these. Um, I might have used a little bit of naphthamide maroon. But I'll put a question mark next to that just in case. Okay, then this one up here was the um, that fungus, the um, Ganoderma. And I think I used the um, Quinacridone Sienna QS, which is um, that color right there, Quinacridone Sienna. Most of these are Daniel Smith colors. Quinacridone Sienna. I have the chart somewhere um, from the company. Quinacridone Sienna plus, which one is that? It's either Burnt Umber or um, it's either Burnt Umber or Italian Burnt Sienna. Wait, Titanium, M.A. Nat Sienna. Oh, it's the Italian Burnt Sienna. Okay, Italian Burnt Sienna, IBS, or Irritable Bowel Syndrome. 
Okay, this color maybe looks like irritable bowel syndrome. Okay, QS plus IBS. That was it on that one. Okay, and this one was the um, gourd. I mean, the, the back massager. That's a pretty good color match, I'd say. Um, and this one was like a pure pigment, um, not pure pigment, but um, one of the pure colors straight out of my palette. And that's the, um, oh, that's the Monte Amiata Natural Sienna, named after a uh, mountain in Italy, I believe. M-A-N-S. And I'll just write pure next to that with water. Look at this granulation I got here. And I feel like the water, the, the paper that I'm using used to be better. Uh, Stillman and Burn, please contact me and let me know why you changed the paper. Or if you didn't change it, why does it seem different? But you can see here, I did get some granulation and this can be fun um, when you're doing color mixing and color matching. Um, sometimes that can actually help. This was that leaf. So on this leaf, there is variation in color. Um, and like, how can you show that? I mean, you could spend five hours with like a colored pencil maybe, or a really fine brush trying to match, um, those hairs and draw those pale hairs in on top, but that would be kind of crazy. Or with watercolor, you can use some of the natural patterns and randomness of watercolor, um, to get that a little bit. So you can see here, there is some texture just from the nature of the, the little bit of granulation. And I think chromium oxide does granulate. You can see there's a little bit of texture in this one as well. Um, so it's possible to use um, your watercolors to create those textures for you, but you don't have control over them. So it really takes practice. Um, and in the same way we're practicing color matching, you can practice those types of effects because some things in nature like if you could get a good granulating effect, you could probably copy the color of this leaf much more accurately with some type of random texture than trying to draw them individually. And Alexandra is asking about the Stillman and Burn, and I think this one is the Alpha. Yeah, Alpha is the one that I usually use. I've used uh, Beta and Zeta too, but I can't remember off the top of my head. Um, why I didn't like them as much, or I don't use them as much. I, I tend to not use the really heavy one. Um, this is 150 GSM, so I get, I think I get 100 pages, and the other one I get half that, and I don't usually need that heavy of paper, and sometimes I do quite big washes, um, and still usually don't need the heavier paper. Okay, so what I'm gonna do is write down CO, chromium oxide, a great color. Um, and then on this one, oh shoot, I should have done it this way. Oh yeah, okay, I still can. So on these ones, I think it was just chromium oxide. That was definitely the main color. And then down here, it was um, chromium oxide plus I used some gouache. And I'm blanking on which gouache it is. Permanent white gouache. Permanent PWG. And I think I use a little bit of Hooker's Green too. Hooker's Green is a dangerous color. Um, and uh, it's so saturated, it's crazy. And it's also really dark, but um, it's a very dangerous color. But surprisingly, just mixing it with gouache, yes, there is white gouache under there. Just mixing it with gouache, the white um, tones it down. So a lot of times when you learn color theory, you learn that, you know, like blacks or browns or purples can tone colors down or the opposite color on the color wheel is also a great thing to tone a color down to reduce its saturation, but adding white also reduces saturation. So always be aware of that. Sometimes it's great and sometimes it's bad. Especially if you're really, if you're really addicted to using gouache a lot, um, you might not realize it, but you're, you're losing the saturated. You can't get those saturated colors quite right. So these are basically, I just did the same things again um, that I did over here. This is like when I did them with Ray Bonto, but the only different one is this lichen. And now I can actually see that there, this color is different um, than that one. But what you'll realize is when you do these experiments, you might realize, wow, I can't really distinguish between those colors or like 
my color matching doesn't really make a difference between these. That's, that's crazy. That that's not right. You know, like there's something not quite right here because on my paper, these two things look like the same color, but in real life, they look, look how different they are. And is that just value? Like, is this just way darker? And if so, why is my color matching of it so pale? That's not, there's something mismatched there. Whereas this one might be more on point. Um, so, you know, value is really important and value is, you know, the light to dark scale. The other thing I could, what I could do next, if I wanted to be more technical, um, is I could come in here and I could see how this is, um, all of these swatches, I could make this a value strip. So I could go from, leave this one just as pale as it is, maybe put two glazes on this one of the same color. Uh, I'll just show you what that would look like. So, um, and then come back and do two all the way across here, let them dry, come back and start with this one, then do three and come back four. That way you'd have one wash, two washes, three washes, four, five, six washes. And you can see how it got darker and how, how it changed with those washes. Oh my gosh, I'm running out of water in my brush already. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna come in here and get my exact, I think this is still the exact same color that I used from before. And hopefully I still have enough um, water in here. Actually, let me just get a little more chromium oxide out. Um, I'll just get a little bit, I'll just get more. And I, do, I don't want it to be, I want it to be the same. I ideally use the same dilution um, every time. I'm running out of water though. Okay, same dilu di dilution and I'm gonna come in here. Oh, I shouldn't be looking at that one. Okay, come in here. Oops, see, that's not diluted enough. That's why it's, it, it's too severe of a shift from that first one to the second one. And ideally it's more of a spectrum. But what I'm gonna do is do this across all of them. Then I would let that dry. And once that's dry, I would come and starting with this one, do all of them across. And that way you get that even continuum. But you wanna make sure that you use the same wash every time and that it's the same dilution. Like if I add a bunch more water in now or get more pigment, then it won't be that proper effect. You know what I'm saying? So that's why this turns into like a really laborious thing. And um, that's why that color chart that I did was absolutely psychotic because it took me forever to get the um, even dilution. So like for each one of these little squares that you see on here, I had like a whole uh, nine by 12 sheet of paper where I tried to get the dilution um, the same and just right. So once this dries, and now is the excuse to bring out my blow dryer again. Um, once this this dries, this, this thing right here, this blow dryer, if you do one of those color charts, having a blow dryer at home, and no, I'm not sponsored by this company. Um, if you have a blow dryer at home, it'll make it so much faster to do a color chart. So then once that's completely dry, then you just keep going back and doing that same thing. So um, on this case, I messed up the first one, but now I'd start with the third one. So that would be three wash. Everything from here to the right will have three washes. And you can see already, um, whoops, that I've gotten to a better approximation of the value of this leaf, but I also have lost the hue. So my hue no longer looks as, I feel like this pale one, matches the hue but doesn't match the value and this one maybe even these these darker ones here match the value the darkness but not the hue so you know our minds often are thinking in in terms of hue but um really the the basic thing especially when you're doing like a landscape painting or um a drawing where you're showing like a a species profile and you're showing like a plant from a bunch of different perspectives or capturing like the leaves of that plant, getting the values right is more important. So I think that's enough about color for today. Let's do some nature journaling of some cool subjects that I have here with me. And um, maybe we can have people who are watching right now vote, people who are watching live can vote on what thing we're going to nature journal next. And I could put it under the document camera so we can look at it up close, but we've got some cool options. We've got, and I know we did this one on Valentine's Day, but we have um, the perennial favorite, um, Salvia Jesnera flora that I picked from my 
Garden, AKA Tequila Sage. Just a little reminder for anyone out there who's a plant breeder or horticulturalist, if you put tequila or chocolate in the name of your plant variety, people will probably buy more of it. Lipstick is another good word to put in there. People seem to buy those plants more, but we could nature journal this. Um, it does have edible flowers on it. You can drink the nectar out. Well, you can at home, but I can drink the nectar out from the back just like a hummingbird. So we could do that one. Salvia jesnera flora, AKA tequila sage. We also have this one, same genus. Um, we can nature journal this one. Let me know in the comments. Um, we can nature journal that plant and that inflorescence. We could also nature journal this sprouted potato. Now this was the thing I was saying that you probably have in your house right now. You might be thinking, Marley, I don't have salvia jesnera flora or an opossum skull that has dried at an awkward angle. I don't have these things. I don't have any bear claws. Um, what can I nature journal? Well, if you have potatoes in your house and you let them grow, it can actually be a fascinating source of wonder for days and weeks to come. And um, if you nature journaled it at different stages of growth, that would probably be the coolest thing. But even this one that's just been neglected in my closet has a lot going on that we can nature journal right now. I don't see too many people voting in the comments, so I might have to choose one myself. We could um, nature journal this bird foot right here. It's a zygodactyl um, bird foot. That means it has two toes going forward and two toes going backwards. Um, that gives you a big hint about what kind of bird it is. Speaking of birds, we could nature journal this skull right here. Might be related to that foot that you just saw. We could nature journal, whoa, this um, bird wing right here. Okay, no one's voting. That means I'm going to choose what we're going to nature journal. And I think, I think I know what I'm going to pick. And what I'm going to pick is um, the special guest for today that produced this. Today's episode of the Nature Journal Show is brought to you by Lizard Poop. Oh, Jack. Oh, now people are voting. Okay. Oh, man. All right. People are voting now that I said that I was going to choose. Okay, I see one vote for the potato and one vote for the bird wing. Maybe I could put them both under the document camera and people can nature journal one or the other. How about that? So I'm going to get my I'm going to get a new page together and I'm going to get the document camera back on here um, and I'll put out the bird wing and the potato and people can um, pick their poison um, to nature journal. So let me set those out there. And then also what you can do is you can start with whatever um, perspective I have it in at first. But then um, once you draw that or nature journal that part, you can ask me in the comments to zoom in or, or zoom out um, or um, flip it over or something like that. And you could try nature journaling it in a different perspective. I'm going to put a um, lighter thing underneath the bird wings to make it more – or maybe I'll just – there. Um, you know what? This needs to be like, here we go. All right. So I'm going to get my nature journal. Um, where is my nature journal going to fit? I might have to zoom the camera out a little bit more here. So bear with me. Luckily I created this whole crazy Velcro system for holding the document camera on my ceiling slash wall. Okay, so what I'm going to try to do in an ideal world is I'd have both of these items and my nature journal so you can see what I'm doing. All right, so Jackson and Annetta, you can both start nature journaling. Um, and anyone else who's, who's watching can start nature journaling either of these subjects. If you have any questions or, or you know, like want to see a slightly different perspective, just type it into the comments in the chat, and then I will, um, I will move it, or I will, I will see if I can look closer and answer any of your questions. Because remember, uh, nature journaling is not just drawing a facsimile of something in life; it's looking closer, 
um, asking questions, trying to understand things. You know, like if you want me to give you any measurements, I could do that. Maybe I'll just lay out my goniometer um, here so you can even have a scale. This might not be the best scale. Let's do this. An approximate scale. Oh, there's a glare. Okay, I'm gonna, um, this document camera is really sensitive to that, so give me a second here. Um, what I've realized is that having a black desk is not helpful for this kind of stuff. Let me um, turn the light down a little bit and see if that, oh yeah, there we go. How's that? Let's see if that changes when I get into position. See, and then my white paper is just way overexposed because of the black table. All right, how's that? Is that better? Chocolate. Okay. Why am I whispering? I don't know. If you want to put metadata, you could. Um, but it's kind of weird doing metadata when you're indoors, I guess. I'm going to just start with some quick sketches to tell you the truth. And I'm going to try shrinking stuff to a size I usually don't shrink it to. So pay attention to scale. You know, like a lot of us will draw things always at the same size. And I don't know if it's like we draw it at the same percentage of, of the size that we see, like, shrunk 50% or shrunk 75% or I don't I don't know if it's a percentage thing or if it's a size on our paper but a lot of us draw um, at the same scale every time now I'm seeing that my drawing even though I'm using dark black inks not even going to show up because of the this exposure I'm gonna make I'm gonna have to paint my table um, paint my table a, a lighter color or else this is never gonna work because um, my drawings are always the paper is too white and the table is black. But think about scale. So if you always draw things really small or you always draw things like almost lifelike, try um, varying the sizes uh, uh, in your drawing, you know? Super important practice for artists. It's sort of like push-ups. Just like earlier we were doing sit-ups for color. Those are those are like those, those exercises, those basic exercises or like squats or whatever. Um, or like for a musical instrument, you know, you practice the scales. And so what we were just doing with color is a version of that. And for drawing, a version of that would be um, changing the size of something and practicing like, okay, I'm drawing a cat. And in one drawing, I'm going to draw it and it's only going to be like um, an inch tall. And in another drawing, I'll fill up the whole page. Can you control that? Because a lot of us are unconsciously always doing it at the same exact size and we're not even aware of it, and it wasn't a choice. That is a good idea, Alexandra. I actually have newsprint. That's genius. I was thinking, what could I, what do I have that I could use? And I didn't think that newsprint is probably perfect. Let's try that right now. Hopefully um, that won't bother anybody. Like if you're painting the black background or whatever, probably not. I have this giant newsprint from when I was doing figure drawing, but I don't do that anymore because none of the places are open. Genius idea, Alexandra. Genius, genius. I wish that trick with the um, the um, tablecloth would work in reverse right now. Now, is this going to be? Is it possible this would be too pale? No, because it's close to my. Um, if it's close to the color of my paper, then the camera should match everything, um, and it should work out great, right?
Okay, let's see. Alexandra's saying I'm very kind, but maybe it's just that I uh, know a good idea when I hear one and I'm ready to adapt. Okay, well, let's. Oh, da -da, da -da -da -da. <laughs> well, look at that. You can see my drawing and you can see the, the subjects. Okay, hopefully that didn't throw anyone off too much. I'm noticing there's this light coming in my back window now. Um, but otherwise, this should be great. All right, go ahead and keep nature journaling um, what you are working on. And I'm going to keep working on mine. You can see what I was talking about with scale wise is I did this smaller. Um, because I think my normal tendency, like with this bird wing would be to draw it. Let me show you last time I nature journaled this bird wing. I did it almost like life size. See, it's bigger than life size. So today I'm going to shrink it and try a couple different sizes when you're ready for me to um, flip over um, flip over one of these or, or or examine it more closely just let me know so that's not nature journaling yet that's just um, a sketch now how can I make this more interesting and learn about it. I'll add measurement first. So the potato, the longest sprout on the potato is like seventeen centimeters long. I wonder how much the I wonder how much the um potato weighs. I'm not going to worry too much about composition right now, so I'm just kind of writing stuff all over the place. But there's ways I can incorporate like two small drawings into like a bigger composition, nature journal page composition. Potato, um, potato ways. Oh, there's like a weird, um, let me zoom in on that part. So I'm going to put like a box right there on the little one. And then I'm going to make this arrow that comes all the way around here. You can always use arrows, even if it becomes sort of out of control and looks like spaghetti on your page. You can still do this, like if you if you don't have space up there to zoom in or do something you want, or even you run out of space for writing, you can make an arrow coming all the way over here, and then over here um, you could write what you need to write. The other technique for that would be to put like a number or a letter or a symbol over here and then continue that um, symbol down here and then put that other um, sort of like appendix information. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to zoom in on this little part of the potato right here. You don't necessarily need to be doing this if you're um, nature journaling also, but this is what I'm going to do. Oh, I'll make a box first. That'll help keep things under control. So I'm going to make a, a box of the approximate size I want for this. Making boxes in advance can be hard because you don't know how much information you're going to fit in there. So it's a little bit of one of those things of like, um, you don't you don't want to do too much of that because you don't know what you're going to find out or how interesting. Maybe this part of the potato is going to turn into the most interesting thing, and I want my whole page for it. In which case, you can add boxes and stuff like that afterwards. Um, Jackson is asking for the. Um, do you want it from like the the just the whole longest length, or do you want it from like where this bone is to like the end of the primaries, or do you want like from the the just the longest part of the feathers? Let me let me know. Um, okay, zoom in on this. 
Um, okay, well, I'll give you a couple measurements. Um, so from like where the, the, the wing actually like the bone part ends to um, the furthest tip of the primary is 24 centimeters or about uh, nine and a half inches. And then the um, the longest spread of feathers is twenty nine centimeters, or um, is it? okay. The longest part of the feathers is uh, twenty nine centimeters, eleven and a half inches. Okay, so this zoomed in part of this potato. Um, there is like what I'm noticing, and I'm curious about is this there's a, there's something over here that's like a curly q um maybe i could zoom in a little bit hopefully this will be okay for everybody um there's a curly q on the potato on this end um that's attached to it i'm going to ask some questions about that that might tell me or you something um, and i could even do a compare contrast between this thing and this thing I don't want to come up with too much of a theory about what it is yet, even though I'm pretty sure I know. I don't think potatoes have umbilical cords, right? That could be a silly thing to put in that it reminds me of. So if you do, I notice, I wonder, it reminds me of. It can be fun to have silly things in that it reminds me of, especially if you're working with kids. You know, and if something reminds you of food, well, this is food, but like if you're nature journaling something in the outdoors that isn't food and it reminds you of food that's always a good way to remember things um, or if they're absurd it reminds you of like making this remind me of an umbilical cord is on the absurd side but that mixing in a little bit of humor and not being too serious about your nature journaling is actually like really beneficial and that um, uh, humor is good for your brain and it helps you remember things better so like the Greeks and Romans had these amazing memory techniques for remembering long speeches and stuff like that. And a lot of them used um, humor. How am I going to draw these wrinkles? Humor and absurdity, because for whatever reason, if you can connect things to humor and absurd images, um, it's easier to remember. Okay, so now I'm going to put in some words. This is a great example of like, if you're paying attention to my drawing, you might be like, whoa, that looks really weird it's not recognizable as a potato. It could be a lot of things and it just kind of looks weird. So this is the point where you might ha start having weird feelings of like, oh no, I roomed my, my page. This looks so weird. Like, well, that's when you make this into a diagram and you remind yourself that you're not trying to make a pretty portrait of a weird sprouting potato. And the subject is not an easy one. People don't have like a clear image. Whereas like even this bird wing, people have a more clear image of that in their mind. Um, even like if it's sort of simplified or a cartoon or even something like this, you know, like a, um, a mandible from a skull, um, a simplified drawing of this, people will understand what that is. Whereas there's other things like this that the drawing might look kind of weird. So just remind yourself of that and what you're there for in the first place and then start turning into a diagram like notes. You could even literally write what it is, uh, like wrinkled potato, with weird curly Q thing. And then um, I could write questions. What is it? Is it related to the big stem? Another type of question, just to go into question asking for nature journaling, is to back up more and, and, and don't assume things. So on one end of the spectrum, there's a lot that I know about this potato that could shift my questions and my thinking um, in a lot of ways that are probably correct and jump to conclusions that are probably correct. But one of the things that nature journaling can teach us, and this is especially important for parents 
um, or if you're working with kids or you just want to be able to think better. Like if you're in a creative career or you're in a line of work that really requires coming up with new ideas and, um, or even with communication, like for communicating with your loved ones, being able to back up and not have very many assumptions is super helpful. So instead of asking questions that are built on assumptions about this potato, I'm going to back up and intentionally practice asking a question that I, I, I think I know the answer to. So um, I asked so far, what is it, which is a very simple question. So let's get more specific about that. I asked, is it related to the big stim? Um, and then, and then one th the question I'm going to ask is, um, is it part of the potato at all? And part of you is going to say, that's a dumb question. Um, I know the answer to that already. Why should I ask that question? It's definitely part of the potato. Um, all of those things, but just practicing stepping back and, uh, asking questions like that is really useful and a lot of huge discoveries or huge oops moments in human thinking and human history have come when people did not ask those questions or people did ask those questions about things that were always taken for granted or always assumed so i'm pretty sure that this did come from the potato but um just as an exercise for making your brain more flexible because um you know, maybe this example is a little bit too, uh, or this metaphor is a little bit too, analogy is a little bit too extreme. But for example, in your communication with people in your family, there might be things that are like this that you're like, oh, that's definitely part of the potato. Oh, they definitely want this or think this or, um, uh, you know, meant this when they said this thing to me. Well, maybe you're assuming something and what would be the question that you can back up and ask that you're not asking right now? Um, so is it part of the potato at all? How could I learn? How could I, how could I learn or prove? How could I learn if it is part of the potato? So these are just some of these question asking tools. And I know there's probably some people who are like, oh, I, I just want to do the color mixing and the beautiful art. Um, and then there's probably some people who are uh, like, especially teachers or parents maybe are more interested in doing some of these um, thinking tools, like how can we think better through nature journaling and practice certain types of thinking. I recommend trying to do a little bit of both. You'll be surprised how they complement each other. Um, so for people who are nature journaling any of these, do you want more zoomed in? How about we do a moment of um, zooming in more on each of them and you can get a chance to add some of the details um, or zoom in and choose a part that you want to do sort of like the way I zoomed in on this part of the potato um, so like Jackson if there's part of the, the bird wing that you want me to zoom in on um, and you want a nature journal more or you want to look at the other side or something um, that now would be a good time to do that and if anyone who's working on this um, maybe we could zoom in even closer and I think what I'm going to do is just do a little bit more sort of like free drawing of different aspects of this potato. Um, there's definitely green stuff up at the top, which is cool. Maybe I'll put this this way. When I did this, I zoomed in on um, one of the edge, one of the ends of the feather and focused on that. Or maybe I looked at one of the places where the feather's broken. So I'm going to zoom in on one of these spots now on the potato. And I'm going to use my same kind of, I'm going to try to be cons somewhat consistent with how I do that. So I'll make a square um, going around this part like that. And I'm still using my gray. One of the things I love about this gray. And oh gosh, where should I put it? Oh, it's not going to fit on the screen now. Sorry, folks. I'm going to have to show you this one when I'm done drawing it, I guess. Oh, Jackson wants to see the other side of the wing. Okay. This side is darker, and it also has the more contrast with these um, gray feathers there. I'm going to zoom back out again. Sorry for anyone who needed it really close. I think this will actually be better in mo most ways.
for how primitive this um, document camera system is that I have literally Velcroed onto my ceiling, um, it actually kind of works. Okay, so Jackson, I think one of the main things you can see now is this contrast between the, um, the, the these feathers, which I think the primaries, the secondaries maybe in this whole group here, there's definitely a big difference there. Um, all right, and now you can see where I'm gonna work on the next stage of my potato. Um, so I'm gonna zoom in into here. And the main thing I'm noticing is this stem comes down like this. There's actually little hairs, very, very little hairs everywhere. I'm just gonna show those. Um, and then there's like these weird bumps and then there's a stem. Ooh, comes off the off the camera. You can't see it. And the stem looks like it's dead at the end. That's interesting. As you draw things, you'll notice things that you didn't notice before. So it's definitely like a meditation and an exercise in attention and noticing. Like I did not um really pay that much attention to how these tips are dead on the potato. Um, I think you can see that, but this is the one I'm drawing right there, and there's like a uh, dark spot where it's, oh, and there's look, there's even a little bit of branching, and there's like a fuzz over the whole thing, which I didn't notice that before. And even though it's a pale fuzz and I'm using black ink, I'm just going to go ahead and um, draw a bunch of black lines because um, I'm not going for photorealism and I don't have time to somehow use, reserve the white or draw like a dark background and then paint over it with white gouache or um, white paint pen or anything like that. I just need to give, communicate the information that there are hairs on here. And I could, I could use my writing to say that they're pale hairs everywhere. Um, and then I'll ask a few questions and use some arrows. Oops, I should have used a different type of arrow than what I used over there. Um, what are these bumps? Okay, so those are some examples there of um, what you could look at. Now I'm going to start um, wrapping this up by zooming in. Um, for everybody and giving you a chance to you could even take a screenshot of what these things look like close up um, Something you could always do um, And this will also be available on my YouTube channel afterwards, but let's zoom in and get some more like close-up stuff um, Just to at least look at together even if we don't get like detailed drawings of these things so Let's see what we got going on here, and I can show you some of what I got on my page too. But um, yeah, it would be really fun to contrast this thing right here, this dried out thing, um, with this thing over here. And um, just to give you the information that I know since I grew this potato, this is actually the stem from when it grew um, in my garden last spring. Um, and this is the stem that it grew in storage. Um, then you can see, you know, like I should have eaten it. If I was going to eat it, I should have eaten it a, a while ago. And I don't, I think it's growing this way without light. That's why there's hardly any green on it. There's a teeny little bit of green up here, but it's kind of cool because, um, you can see that this is a stem and the stem can produce either roots or it can produce vegetative parts. Um, so the roots are what go into the dirt and collect nutrients and water, and the vegetative parts are what photosynthesize. So depending on what the, the tuber is exposed to, it could produce either one. And this one doesn't look to me like it has any roots on it yet, even though this is white, and we often think of white as um, an indicator of roots. This, um, I don't think, is a root. But just some background information on that if you want to add background information. Now, the important thing with nature journaling is to think about epistemology, 
Epistemology is is the philosophy of knowledge, and this is going to be the big vocab word for today. So um, I think everybody should know what this is, epistemology. And it also has to do with um, where knowledge comes from. And we often mix this up, and this is a real problem in nature journaling, because um, in our it's a real problem in our culture, and uh, nature journaling helps us see it. But um, a lot of what we think we know about nature and about plants is things that we heard from other people, things that we saw on TV or things that we read or saw online. And that knowledge can be important, but it's, it's fundamentally different from things you observe yourself. So when you're nature journaling and you do, I notice, I wonder, it reminds me of, people mix this up because I notice is about what you directly observe in nature. If you saw something on the Discovery Channel, um, or David Attenborough told you that you know um, the flying foxes like can only raise one baby at a time, that's not something that you notice. That's something um, that you heard, or that you read, or that you saw someone else say, or you saw online. And that's fundamentally different from something you observe directly. So I notice is what you observe directly. Then I wonder. Those are your own questions. And what I do when I teach nature journaling is I let people in the it reminds me of bring up the information that David Attenborough told them or bring up the thing that you read online or bring up the thing that Marley told you about the potato um, and that this was from last year or that this is a tuber or that this is not photosynthetic or that whatever, you know? So just making that distinction between um, what you observed directly um, in nature and what you read or heard from somewhere else. And that is um, about epistemology, where that knowledge comes from. So um, those are a couple fun things to Nature Journal today. Let's look at the wing a little bit more, since I know Jackson was working on that one. Um, if you're still here, I have a feeling you're probably going to have to go make dinner or something. Um, this is actually from a band-tailed pigeon. And I'm not super knowledgeable about um, feathers and stuff like that, but the way that these dried, they didn't end up in a fully natural position. So you can see some of them, they're overlapping in different ways. One interesting thing that I noticed when I nature journaled this is there's a pale edge on a lot of these feathers and a dark interior. That's really hard to draw with watercolor. So I'll show you the technique that I used. It's similar to the problem of drawing these pale hairs. Um, especially with watercolor and other drawing techniques, we are using dark marks on light paper. So there is a couple ways around that without doing like an oil painting. And I'll show you one strategy um, right here. So when I nature journaled this bird wing, you can see um, I drew a background color um, around the outside. And then I colored in the dark part of the, the feather and then that way I left the white as a line um, right there. The other option would be to um, draw the whole feather um, as a dark color, like using your watercolor or using even ink or, or pencil potentially, and then um, using like a white paint pen to get that edge. Um, other cool things to, to notice on here would be like where there's um, damage on the feathers. That can be really fun to look at. Um, when you get a chance to look at birds or parts of birds, there is a little bit up here. Um, so that's some information about this for anyone that nature journals um, this at home. And for our last thing today, I'm going to show you a couple pages. Maybe someone has already guessed what this item right here is. Um, and um, the first thing I would notice about it is that there's a very big difference between this color here and the rest of it. Um, it's heterogeneous. It's not all the same. It kind of looks like there is some plant matter in there and some animal uh, matter. It's shiny. Um, it's bumpy. It's very lightweight. Um, I could do some experiments of like seeing how easily it crumbles, if I can identify anything in there. I do see some stuff that reminds me of Jerusalem cricket. So if you haven't guessed already, um, now's my chance to tell you, but it is from an alligator lizard. I'm almost positive that's an alligator lizard um, poop. And reptiles have 
um, reptiles and birds, when they poop, they have two separate things. This is all white stuff. This is ur the uric acid, I believe. Um, and this is the, the contents, the actual food contents. So it's, I think part of it is because, um, birds and reptiles don't poop and pee. They just, everything comes out all in one package. So I'm going to get a page ready here and do, to do a couple quick sketches, um, and bring out this, um, alligator lizard that I just caught today and I will release it right away. It's been very calm. Um, and I have it in a, in a little situation where it can hide under some leaves. Um, but let me fix my, the light behind me and then I will um, show you this alligator lizard and we can try doing a couple quick sketches and I can show you some of the nature journal pages I did um, with it before. All right, that's my fancy lighting control. Now, um, let me show you some of these pages I did last time I got a nature journal this, and this was doing um, the nature journal family, which is a month long program that I do. Um, I do it every month. There's a new round and families can sign up and um, nature journal with me on zoom. And then um, it's a really cool learning community that provides a lot of motivation for the kids and makes it really easy for the parents to be together with their family and get like to relax and have like a valuable educational fun experience and so here are some um, stuff that we did in that program looking at like how the toes work and trying to come up imagine all these different questions um, and here's more diagrams of the lizard also did um, I think this was with the other group of families each group has between four to six families that all work together and then you get a share and kids get to practice like public speaking and stuff like that if that's something you'd be interested in for for April March is already full and ready to go but um, for April it's the sign up is on my website marleypiper.com so here is what we did in this case is I showed people how to put their um, their main subject in the middle with a sketch like that and then to basically write questions and do diagrams all around the outside and we talked a lot about you know how certain things can be hard to draw like this front on face of this lizard was really hard but it shows important information about how the lizard's vision works and how how I formed these different questions about its vision because I was curious about their um, binocular vision so those are some examples of um, diagramming and nature journaling and sketching that I got to do with this alligator lizard and what I'm gonna do right now is I'm going to um, show it to you and maybe we can do some quick sketches together but if you want to um, do more, what you can do is you can go back to the video. Once this is no longer live, you can go back to the video on my YouTube and you can just pause it at the different stages and get a better um, perspective. You could do that with any of my videos where I'm doing like a nature journal adventure. There's some creature that you want to see more in depth. Just pause the video. You can go back and use those videos as sort of like a um, source material for your drawing and your nature journaling. So let's switch to the document camera, the action camera here, um, and get ready um, for our special guest today. Let me see if that light will be better. I better get to a good page so that I'm ready to nature journal right away. Um, get my clips on here. Maybe I'll try filling this in or else if I just do gesture drawings, I'll probably go over here. All right, Jackson's got to go. See you, Jackson. Have a good rest of your day. Uh, thanks for joining in. Okay. All right, here we go. I'm going to talk quieter now. So I would do a gesture sketch right away. Go for the shape. It doesn't like it when things go up above it, so I'm not gonna adjust the, the, um, the light. So you're not gonna be able to see my drawing very well, but just focus on the lizard and try to capture the basic shape at least. 
And maybe if you do it small, that'll be easier and faster to finish and you can do multiples. Focus on that basic shape. There's a lot of information in that gesture shape. Not easy to draw, but try. Okay, that was one. Now I'm gonna go, I'm gonna go ahead and do a second one. I'm looking more at the three-dimensional shape there now. The wrap down, up near the head. Okay. Sometimes talking to yourself as you draw helps your observation. Whoops, totally messed that part up. That's fine. Keep going, the head comes out here. Okay, I'm gonna do a third one. Third gesture sketch. Basic cylinders. Remember, all of these things that you draw, almost all of these things you draw in nature are these cylinders. Even if you don't like reptiles, these cylinders are going to help you out later on for the other things that you want to draw. And if you can, the next thing besides the gesture and those basic kind of shapes would be to go for where are the darks? Like I see dark here on this part of the tail. I see dark here on the side of the head. Carve in those darks. And if you don't see legs, don't draw legs. Don't draw legs where you don't see legs, okay? Try to draw what you actually are seeing and you might actually learn something like that the legs are less important than you thought. All right, Annette has to go. Thanks, Nature Sketches. I'm really glad that you came and joined with your boys. That was fun. Oops, I startled the lizard a little bit. So if your subject moves, if your bird or whatever moves, change, change your drawing and do a new one. Maybe look at the head now. Notice how these three are practically all the same size. Another thing I could do is notice all my drawings are coming out the same size. Maybe I should... Um, adapt it and maybe like do like a really big head right here. That's what I'm going to do. So when I was doing this with the nature journal family classes, um, that the people who signed up for February, I looked at the zoom screen while we were drawing the lizard and uh, nature journey, the lizard. And I paid attention to how long people were looking down at their paper. So if you're drawing something from life, and you're looking at your drawing more than 50% of the time, that's a bad sign. That means you're focusing on, and it's totally normal too, but remember self-awareness. Well, I made that eye way too big. If you're looking at your own drawing for more time than you're looking at your subject, that just shows that you're thinking about your drawing and, and, and all precious and absorbed in your drawing, and you're not actually noticing the information coming from the real world. And that's fine to do that and add like touch things up, especially after the animal is gone. But while the animal is there, um, you should really be looking at it more than you're looking at your own drawing. So right now I'm still doing mostly gesture sketching. This kind of thing, this is kind of more like pure art. It's not, it is part of nature journaling, but if you're nature journaling something like this, you definitely want to be, you know, doing some questions. Ooh. Sudden movement there. Um, you're doing some questions and some diagramming and things like that. So remember, you can come back to this video on my YouTube and you can pause it at any moment where you see the lizard and practice sketching it more. Um, just to give you a little bit more material in that uh, like regards, like notice like, what do you notice about the tail here? Like how would you nature journal that? Um, what about its behavior? You know, does it move at certain times more than others? It moves, it mainly seems to move when I come above it. So it doesn't, it's a, definitely more afraid of things coming from above. And I think it's been very cooperative. So you can come back and pause this video at any time. If you want a nature journal, uh, an alligator lizard, I think this is the Northern California alligator lizard species. So even if you're stuck at home, you can still nature journal. You can look at potatoes that are, that you can let grow if they're not already growing um, in your pantry or you could check out the nature journal show and you could go back to any of my videos like this one and rewind and look at things that I have showed you before, or you, there's a ton of other ways. And you've probably already seen some of my videos, but I have a couple of videos 
specifically about how to nature journal at home, where I think I give you like 10 tips of how to nature journal at home. I have a whole video about how to do a nature journal safari in your refrigerator. So um, there's, you know, if you're stuck at home for whatever reason, there's still plenty of nature journaling you can do. You don't have to get out um, and go to Yosemite or Yellowstone or um, Alaska or Tanzania. So I hope this video was really fun for you. And I just um, reached a huge landmark with my YouTube channel where I have um, a thousand subscribers and I have 4,000 hours of watch time. So that means that people have watched my videos and learned nature journaling for 4,000 hours. Um, and that's pretty crazy. And it's also a landmark, it's mainly a landmark because at that point, YouTube allows you to monetize. And I don't plan on making advertisements come up here because then you'll be seeing like toothpaste ads or whatever coming up down here. Um, I don't plan on doing that but I am trying to be sustainable with the nature journal show and teaching nature journaling is my full-time job. So some of you are already patrons, like for example, Suzanne Marshall, thank you so much for joining. And also thank you for being a patron. You can support the nature journal show on Patreon. And even for just like $1 a month, that helps me make these shows every single week. Right now I'm making two a week, which is awesome and providing lots of information for you. I have a back catalog of over a hundred videos with interviews, all kinds of stuff. And I'm going to keep making them because this is my gift and this is what I love to do. And if you support me on Patreon, you can get access to some special um, patron only stuff and also support me continuing to make this in a sustainable way without having to put toothpaste ads or anything like that down at the bottom. So let me know in the comments um, what you like nature journaling most. Did you do the color um, matching challenge? And if you can't wait all the way till next week for another episode of the show, just check out my library. There's a ton more videos in there. Thanks everyone for joining. That was super fun. Bye. Bye.